from legendary locals we all know to people you should get to know. Follow Ipswich Today on your favourite app and never miss an episode or go to ipswichtoday.com.au. Coming up, another chapter in the Swift saga, AI making its presence felt in council, Ipswich motions for the LGAQ conference later this year, and council's We Can't Wait advocacy almost nuked in the council meeting when Andrew Antonelli called for an immediate halt to the campaign. All this and more with Mayor Teresa Harding, who joins the show. It's Friday, July 26, 2024, and I'm Alan Roebuck. Welcome to Ipswich Today, which acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which it is produced and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. This podcast is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. The following interview was recorded on July 25 after the regular monthly meeting of Ipswich City Council. Thanks for speaking with Ipswich today, Mayor Harding. My pleasure. Thank you, Alan. This month's council meeting was another marathon effort, uh, probably twice as long as you expected, I think. But let's start with some of the items uh, on the agenda. The Nicholas Street Precinct, there are new leases. There was a special meeting before council. How many new leases has council signed up? Uh, Look, in the entire precinct, there's there's 36 tenancies. We have uh, 16 leased. We have three that are approved, ready to go, and we have five offers under negotiation. But I guess in total, nearly some of those leases are quite big, Hoyts and general public, almost 80% of the commercial space across the precinct is now leased. So we have wonderful um, uh, businesses such as Gelatissimo, Sushihio, Zimbrero, Bum Bum Bao, Terry White, Sophia Nails, Authentica, That Dumping Place, Stella Rosta, Open Minds, Hoyts General Public, VE Group, Indy School and, and Red Cross. So it's really great to see. I did walk past uh, the where Hoyts is going to be and finally you can see the artist impression coming to life as you look through the hoardings. It's magnificent, isn't it? And and today um, we were looking at a, a another restaurant. And if you look at the top floor where where the um, the cinema is, um, this will occupy the restaurant space over to the right on the top floor there. Getting around town, there's a bit of a buzz for the opening of the Commonwealth Hotel. Is there an opening date? Commonwealth Hotel um, tenants will be announcing that. That's up to them. They are doing a tremendous social media campaign. They've launched you know, foundation members. It look, the facade's gone down. It's looking fantastic. So, look, Oz Hotels are very experienced. They're, they're multiple award winners. And, it, you know, we're looking forward to that opening in spring. AI, or artificial intelligence, is making its presence felt in council with the adoption of an AI policy. Why is this needed? What are the risks if council doesn't have an AI policy? I think there's the opportunities and the risk. It's, it's opportunities for organisations to create cost savings and, you know, hopefully enhance customer experiences. However, there are risks such as, um, you know, uh, I guess inaccuracy, security, privacy, intellectual property, that all needs to be managed. And look, this has been a real focus area for the Audit and Risk Management Committee. They've been very active in this space for some time. So we've been looking at what kind of framework we will have and what kind of policy we'll have. And this policy adopts the AI ethics and principles developed by the Commonwealth Government, which includes privacy protection, reliability, fairness, contestability and transparency, which is really important when you hold a lot of um, data of, of residents. Stone Quarry Cemetery. There were some more recommendations put to council today and some changes since the committee meeting. What's happening at Stone Quarry? Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, community consultation, especially with the local residents there, as, and as well as the Islamic community and the different um, Islamic groups in Queensland and, and the local area. Um, look, we do know that um, cemetery sites are, are sacred. Um, it's, it's usually quite emotional. So I guess uh, we asked today just for a few more things to come to council for approval rather than living with council officers who, you know, make great decisions, but just know the, the extra sensitivity we've asked for a few more things come to council for approval so so we can get it right. I did note there was much discussion about signs, wording on signs. I even heard you say you've been burnt too many times. What did you mean by that? Oh, just a few things that have occurred where things have gone out where, where the councillors and myself uh, didn't know. So no policy w- was broken and it's it's not deliberate, but you know, no, no, no one's perfect and some things have slipped through the cracks. Another chapter in the long running saga of Swifts at Cameron Park and what council is going to do with that building and the immediate land surrounding it. What is the current state of play? Yeah, look, council's leased the land and the facilities um, there at Beval to Swifts since September 
2001, with the current agreement continuing to lease for 20 years. So after decades of use, uh, SWIFT's, um, that the, the building needs significant rehabilitation and refurbishment to you know, to meet existing standards. The major works could cost up to $7.4 million over many years. And we're obviously trying to get a, a good deal for Swiss, but also for our residents as well, um, especially during a cost of living crisis. So Swiss have expressed interest in buying the land and had plans to refurbish it, but uh, based on community consultation, um, that was knocked back. So we've been negotiating with, with Swiss since, I guess, um, early 2023. On that, so we're looking at um, having, I guess, a longer lease there, and um, I guess a reduced cost to council and the, and the residents. Um, but hopefully, it's a really beneficial situation for Swifts to where they can um, do renovations there and fit outs that they really want as well. Moving to the Merrill Minute, a permanent police presence at Town Square Red Bank Plains. I think everybody thinks that's a great idea. So, where did your minute go, and do you think it'll happen? Yeah, look, that was in February, and we got a res- we had a response back from the state government, um, and in particular, I also spoke with the Premier and um, Mark Ryan, who's the Minister for Police, when they had that Ipswich Cabinet here. And um, look, the, the response isn't to have a police beat there permanently, um, but we did get notification that um, the Queensland Government have announced 40 extra police and 10 new police cars that will roll across Ipswich in the next few years. Um, I think that'll have a big impact. We've also had a lot of conversations with police and they talk about um, the, the, the the mobile police office and, and the mobile police bit that, which they can move around. Um, you know, we're growing. There's more and more shopping centres in different areas. Um, this, the police telling us that they're able to respond better to the community needs by having that mobility rather than having bricks and mortar where someone's there from nine to five weekdays. So um, let's see how that goes. And, and hopefully um, that more visible police presence will go a long way to achieving what, we, what, what we're after. Also at the council meeting this month, Ipswich City Council is putting forward some motions for the LGAQ. What's on the agenda this year? We've got four motions that will be going to the LGAQ conference uh, in in Brisbane uh, in October. One is just to uh, look at how um, rates and charges are done at the moment with with levies and so on. If if council puts on a levy, it's just a flat rate, whether you have a one-bedroom apartment uh, and and are on a pension or if you've got a you know a six bedroom house, so sometimes we're looking at how we apportion fees. We try to get that balance right um, for residents. So it would be great if we could get uh, more clarity on that. The second one is for um, the fire ant suppression task force. The the fire ant cost is being put onto local governments. So for the last couple of decades, the state and the federal governments have spent I think over twenty million dollars and without much success and um, and they haven't eradicated and they've put all the cost back onto council for council land. So we know it's going to cost us at least $300,000. So um, I expect there'll be a number of fire ant um, motions there. The third motion is calling on the state government to expedite the work outlined um, in the Queens and Heritage Advisory Panel uh, just to give councils more, uh, I guess, oomph when it comes to provisions for uh, central repair and maintenance work. Um, at the moment, um, they're not very strong. If um, someone's leaving their uh, heritage listed property to, to rack and ruin, so it's it's demolition by neglect. We don't have those top provisions that you have in Western Australia and other areas that um, that would compel the owners to actually um, address and maintain those properties. And the last one, sorry, mm-hmm. is to extend the voluntary home buyback scheme. Um, it's been very popular. We would love to see it as an annual thing so council could, could purchase, you know, 10, 20 properties each year over, over the next um, you know, 10, 20 years. It's, um, it'd be a, go a long way to making our community more resilient. An item that took up a lot of the meeting was discussion on the We Can't Wait campaign that you launched recently, and we've had that on the podcast not that long ago. Why the long discussion? I know there's been some public criticism from uh, Shane Newman and Lance McCallum. Tell us what happened today at the council meeting. Yes, yeah, so um, Councillor Janelli moved uh, to suspend standing orders without any notice to, to, for a notice of motion and noting some of the comments in, in the media, I think uh, we all wanted to, to bring it forward. So uh, Councillor Janelli asked, um, wanted to suspend uh, all advertising and all other aspects of the We Can't Wait campaign. So there was quite a discussion on that, um, a, a long discussion if you want to listen to it. But um, so he was not successful with that. Um, the motion that went up was basically um, supported the We Can't Wait campaign as per the briefings that we've had, as per um, the program that was in the budget that was all, that was approved by all the councillors. Um, so I, I hopefully that puts to bed this, where that campaign was approved from, was approved by councillors, it was um, yeah, re-endorsed today. And I think it's just really important that we get 
get focused back on we can't wait. Um, we know that we're the fastest growing city in, in Queensland, yet we're getting um, per capita the, the second lowest amount of funding for um, roads and public transport in South East Queensland. So, you know, we are, are asking for support for the state and the federal governments to build uh, the Amberley Interchange at the Cunningham Highway um, to support and give $4, $4 million for the final business case for the second bridge crossing because we definitely need that. There's so much congestion around the David Trumpy Bridge. But also continued support support for the Ipswich to Springfield train line. Now, TMO at the moment are doing the business case and we hope to get that in the next year or two, but we need to keep the pressure on uh, to ensure that that train line is built. That's where 70% of our growth is going to be. So it was great to see that that focus and um, some of the things in the media, I, was, I must admit I was quite confused and quite disappointed at some of the commentary that's happened. So I think today that puts to bed um, any things that have been said that were not true or misleading. It was interesting that uh, Marnie Doyle had a notice of motion that which she later withdrew, wanting to release all the correspondence to do with the, the briefings on We Can't Wait. So mm. do you think uh, everything has been aired that needs to be aired? I think so. I, th- I think um, you'd have to speak to her, but I think her intent was to, while well, people were making all sorts of comments in the media, um, which were blatantly untrue, um, you know, let, let people see what, we, what was done. So let, let people see the briefings that were given by council. Let them listen to the video of, of that final briefing where it was discussed. And, and in particular, in that final briefing, Councillor Tinelli talked about the need um, urgently for this advocacy campaign. He actually suggested that if it was successful, we, could, we should roll it out to the federal election. And he also suggested that we could put the We Can't Wait flyers in the state MP's offices and, and did talk about upping the ante for the We Can't Wait campaign. So I was a bit confused with the media yesterday today, but I hope um, today has, has cleared that all up. While we're talking about the media, another little issue that's bubbling along is whether councillors should hold down a, uh, a second job. Well, what's your view? Look, I always go back to the, the law and, and then the um, local government doesn't forbid it uh, at all. Um, and obviously in in, 20, in last term, this came up as well. So look, it's not against the law, but I guess what I do, I encourage councillors to be really, really transparent. Just where, what is it? What, what business is it? Um, or where are you working? And, and how many hours is that? So, uh, for instance, we know that uh, Councillor Cullen and Councillor, uh, and the Deputy Mayor Johnnick have been, and, and, and Councillor Madden, uh, they have businesses, they've been very upfront, they're on their register of interest. Councillor Daly, he's got a real estate licence, but he's been very open in disclosing that here. We can see that Councillor Madsen has listed these a youth worker. I have asked him to update that to include his employer and I think it would be really good for him just to be really transparent with people to say, this is where I'm working, this is what I'm doing and this is how many hours a week. Um, I think people are entitled to that. We are public figures. Uh, we have a legal obligation to um, disclose that. So, look, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how we go and... Um, I do note that your article has probably generated a fair bit of conversation in the community as well, Alan. And I do hope to catch up with Councillor Jacob Madsen in the next couple of days to discuss that further. On that note, uh, Mayor Harding, we'll leave it there. Thanks for speaking with Ipswich today. Thank you so much. Since recording this interview with the Mayor, I've also spoken with Councillor Jacob Madsen and his interview will be featured in the next episode of the show and Inside Ipswich in local Ipswich News. Councillor Antonelli also confirmed to me after the meeting he is happy with the final resolutions to continue with the We Can't Wait campaign. A reminder, you can watch all council meetings on YouTube and there's handy links in the show notes. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This podcast is listener supported. Please make a once only gift or regular donation to help keep it online. Just go to ipswichtoday.com.au. Follow and stream this podcast from your favourite app, including iHeartRadio, or play Ipswich Today on smart speakers. Music is supplied by Purple Planet Music. This is Alan Roebuck. Thank you for listening. Enjoying Ipswich today? Please share the love on your socials.